Hi, the very welcome everyone in all the areas of Chile and also in the world. This is a conversation where the Center Nansen for Peace and Dialogue and Barha Foundation are inviting you to have this conversation with two highly profile experts that we have the ex uh, the the luck to have them with us. Uh, the topic, it is a conversation uh, when we talk about the international dialogue experiences and constituent experiences, how they have been. And this is a conversation that is very rich, interesting, valuable for our country, but uh, and also for other areas in the world. So we are very lucky today because we have Christina Murray from South Africa and Damir Murray from Tunis. And they are going to be introduced by Barbara, that it is from the Varha Foundation. And you are going to receive a little bit of the presentation of uh, who they are and what they have been doing and their experiences and also their rich experience of the Varha Foundation on these matters. I would like to invite also to this conversation to you. So during the whole program, that is going to be an hour and a half, you can send us your comment and questions in the YouTube channel and also in the social network. And uh, you can use the hashtag Por el Dialogo. All the questions are important and valuable. And we are going to try to present those questions to our panelists so they can have a conversation about that. They are going to talk in English. This is going to be translated simultaneously to Spanish. So, Barbara, please help us. Uh, tell us a little bit of the experience of the Barha Foundation and everything that you bring to this conversation. Thank you, Alfredo. Let me have some disclaimer in English. Dear speakers of English, uh, please uh, uh, just be patient because the streaming in English is going to be afterwards. Uh, for the time, it's all in Spanish. Uh, it is a great uh, luxury and pleasure to be with you here today from the Barha Foundation. I coordinate the America, Latin America activities and we have 50 years of working with those topics related to conflict transformation. And this is related to peace processes, national dialogues, and also it is related to constituent processes. So thank you for the invitation. And now let me start by saying that to get out of a violent conflict, it's always a challenge and it, it is more or if we want to build, because if we are so different and we are sharing the spaces, and so it's very difficult to join and build together. So all of these processes, the Chilean process that it's happening now, it's historical actually and unique. There are expectatives, expectations, fears, doubt, and we come with a lot of emotion, expectations uh, to put together a new constitution. So by saying this, that this is unique, it is that doesn't mean that you are alone. We have had uh, situations, countries, people, as Cristina and Damir, that have gone through this. And uh, we are very honored uh, that uh, Nansen Center have invited us to share experiences of other countries. And it is something that the Barha Foundation has been doing. We have seen in this publication, um, we made a manual of national dialogues, and we understand this as something that it is uh, trying to reach a consensus among many people to find a crisis, to get out of a crisis, or to transform deep topics related to, to the peace. With this, we believe that it is really important to take into consideration that there is no recipes. Uh, all these books, it's not a recipe book, it's a book of experiences, uh, uh, red flags and different aspects. And the purpose it is to inspire, to share. And I believe that everyone that is listening here today, they have their own experiences, questions, and to put all of this together is something 
that it is done by our foundation. This year we are celebrating 50 years Berahov, that means uh, uh, form in the mountain, and we were born as a philanthrop philanthropic uh, uh, institution to improve the relationship of among different people that uh, suffered the Cold War. And with the fall of the wall, we also have the intrastate uh, conflict. So the foundation was um, developed and founded. And today, we are working in many countries with um, constituent processes. And with uh, Damir and Christina, we have been collaborating in many of this. Let me tell you how this is going to work out so we can take this opportunity and take advantage of this space. After this introduction, we are going to um, interchange uh, some time between the three or four people that are here in the panel, and then we are going to have some observation, questions, comments, uh, and of course, as uh, Alfredo said, we are going to pay attention also to the questions in social network. So um, I'm not going to make a full and complete inter uh, introduction, but uh, I'm going to mention some things about Christina. She is from South Africa, but today she lives in London. And she has a lot of experience among you, the two of you. You have combined, participated in more than 25 constituent processes. And for us, it is really good to have you with us because you have lived through that. You are not experts because you have studied that, but well, of course, uh, uh, Christine also has a very important uh, academic career, but they, you have lived through this process. You have lived through every step, expectations and deceptions and everything. Christina was one of the seven experts uh, that were uh, elected to consult in the Constituent Assembly in South Africa when they f get out of the apartheid and they were developing a new constitution between 94 and 96, I guess it was. Uh, and uh, she is Emeritus Professor of Cape Town. I am um, just uh, omitting a lot of information, but now she also works with the supporting, with the mediation and uh, from United Nations. And also she has a lot of experience uh, from Fiji, from Kenya and her own. And it is really pleasurable to say hi to Damir because Damir has worked also with Berahoff in different processes. And you started working as a deputy in the Tunis Assembly in the Arab Parliament and also as a member of the uh, National Assembly for Constituents. And um, the agreement of having this constitution made and also the difficulties that you faced and all the processes, bilateral, lateral processes that were originated because of this. And of course, you have worked in other countries, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, South, South Sudan, and the position that you have, it is not related to a uh, constituent assembly, but you are responsible of the national strategy of cyber security in Tunis. Uh, it is a position that it is really important. No more things added. You know that we are going going to be able to go deeper in your experience, but we want you to have or to start actually this conversation to level it up. We are not going to have like a talk here about the constituent processes. We are going to start right away with your experience. Christina, looking back, I would like to ask you 94, yes, yeah, some years there. How 
How was it? How did you feel personally when you were going to take up this position? And what were the main challenges to prepare the constituent convention to put together this new uh, constitution in your role, but also in South Africa as a whole? Well, thank you. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, as Ophelia said, to begin with, a lot of people around the world are watching the news about Chile more intensely than usual, because this is, is, is such an interesting process. But, and you're right, it's, it's almost 30 years ago that our Constitutional Assembly first met. Um, and I suspect that everybody who was in it is, will still say 30 years later that it was the most important thing they did in their lives. Um, I think all of us were excited because um, we knew that this was a, a sort of rare moment and we were anxious, quite filled with trepidation because we also knew that if this failed, um, it wouldn't be good for the country at all. Um, now, I suppose we were fortunate, and I think I'll say this a number of times, that we had quite a large group of people who were determined to make it work. But I think everybody knew how difficult it would be. And of course, I mean, think, think of what happens in these situations. We had many members of our assembly who were, were angry, angry about the past. And we also had members of the assembly who were fearful. I mean, fearful that their interests would be ignored, fearful that um, things that they, values that they held dear would be overridden. So I mean, all the, those complicated things were sort of in front of us as we started, um, but we got through, not without some ups and downs. And I think we should, the challenges were many and we can talk about them a little bit later. One challenge that comes to mind is I think at the beginning of the process is that I at least thought that two years was much too short. And I know you've got less time, but I must say, I was wrong. I learned in that process that the time limit was a very, very important thing, partly because you can't go on making constitutions forever. Um, if there's more time, I mean, we see in Nepal, you know, they had perhaps even more than 10 years, um, I couldn't do anything else in government because of all these things being unsettled. So I learned that um, working to a time limit and being determined to keep it was an important thing. And that was a big change of mind for an academic like myself, who likes to sit and think about everything for years. Anyhow, but Damir, I think, will have different experiences. Very important, this aspect. Damir, how was in 2011 for the population that doesn't know very well Chile, but Chile in this moment has confirmed the election of 155 people that are the constituent members to draw to draft the constitution and they are going to change the constitution by the military government and of course we have some changes and now we want they want to replace it completely it is an innovation it is a group that it is really diverse and that it has gender equality so there you can see the different generations of constituents and constitutions ja damir 10 years ago how was was your position? What were your uh, fears and expectations in your position? Well, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, and uh, uh, let me start first, uh, start by congratulating Chile uh, for already coming together on this issue. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very courageous uh, step and it's, uh, and it's also very important. Uh, uh, the, we have neighboring uh, Libya and, uh, and, uh, and, and there is Syria and there are other countries that could not even come together on how they would go about a new constitution that will settle a lot of the uh, political uh, 
uh, instability and and, uh, and political problems uh, in the country. So uh, I just want to say that uh, you're not about to make the first steps. You have already made the first, the most important steps have already been uh, made. The fact that you are here today with a constitutional assembly uh, to write a constitution, uh, you have come a long, long way. Uh, countries take uh, years to agree that they will come to the step where Chile is uh, right now. Uh, when we started uh, uh, in Tunisia 10 years ago, uh, there was a lot of fear. Uh, uh, people uh, did not know, or the, the average public did not know what, what a constitutional assembly was. And they made no difference between a parliament and a constitutional assembly. And uh, maybe in our case also what made the confusion uh, even more is that uh, our constitutional assembly was both the regular parliament and the uh, uh, and the constitutional assembly, and uh, it took us nearly a year to to resolve that issue, to the point where even when we structured the committees, every member of parliament could be in two committees in general parliament, but. Uh, uh, the, we did the same for the constitution. So we we, we had nine committees, uh, constitutional committees, just like we had uh, the regular parliamentary uh, committees. Uh, it seems that uh, what you have done in Chile is a better way than what we have done. Uh, and I read about this, and uh, and I think it's great that uh, uh, one that you have the constitutional assembly uh, separate from the parliament. I think. Uh, uh, compared to our experience, uh, that's uh, that is a good thing, uh, because then the constitutional assembly can focus on uh, on the constitution. I think that's uh, important. So coming together, I think is is very important. You are at a very important stage, and uh, and focusing on the constitution with a, with a constitutional assembly that does nothing but the constitution uh, is great. Uh, also, uh, in Tunisia, we started this uh, when, uh, after many, many years, nearly 23 years uh, of almost dictatorship, uh, most, most of it was dictatorship, uh, the president was a military man uh, that went into politics. And then uh, got into government, and then bit by bit, uh, he was just uh, taken over everything, and he changed the constitution twice, just to make sure he continues to govern. So by the time we got there, not too many people understood politics or were involved in politics. The dictatorship was so strong that uh, we did not have a lot of political dialogue and political uh, culture. So we started in... Uh, in a very shaky way, and, uh, and and people were 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 afraid because we did not know where we were going, uh, and many people were new to this, so we did not have uh, a lot of uh, ideas. Uh, soon enough, we had uh, lots of external forces that came uh, and helped us, and uh, and I always cite the uh, the special uh, uh, contribution that came from South Africa. Uh, and from from uh, from Portugal, they were with us uh, for uh, for a long time. Uh, ownership of the constitution, uh, it the constitution has to be uh, one. It has to be by everyone. In other words, uh, we agreed that it was not just the members of the constitutional assembly that were uh, writing the constitution. And maybe if we have time, we can get into this, but. Uh, I can tell you right now, I, I was a member of the Constituent Assembly, and I can tell you that no one in the Constitutional Assembly can claim today that the Constitution was written by members of the Constitutional Assembly. Uh, it was written by everyone. And the national dialogue, combined with this uh, opportunity to write a Constitution, uh, actually uh, uh, going from uncertainty uh, at the beginning, uh, where we did not know ever anything, and we did not even understand the situation uh, we were in. But at the end, we ended up with a constitution that was written by everyone, and it was also for everyone. Uh, 
the, 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 the national dialogue of Tunisia, uh, who knew that starting in a very shaky situation and a lot of fear, a lot of disagreements, we did not, a lot of unknown, to the point where we actually got a structure in place, we got a national dialogue in place. And that national dialogue around the constitution ended up delivering a constitution. Uh, and then the national dialogue earned Tunisia uh, the, the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, obviously, nothing was done uh, by design in terms of where we were going to get. However, uh, I would say that uh, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And if in Chile people really believe that the time has come for this idea of a new constitution that will just uh, uh, get us uh, uh, off this uh, past uh, negative and get a country a new start, that framework, just getting the new constitution and getting a modern constitution uh, is worth uh, taking a lot of pain for. The process is not going to be easy. I can tell you that right now. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, there will be setbacks. And uh, history has shown that uh, uh, none of these processes went without, uh, without setbacks and difficulties because uh, just coming to an agreement, finding the mechanism by which you will come to resolving the agreements. And sometimes, uh, I remember personally, I voted for some things on our constitution that I really did not like or did not, uh, uh, did, not uh, did not like, they did not go along with my political thinking. Uh, but mm -hmm. at the end, uh, as a member of the Constitutional Assembly, I did not represent myself. M Mr. Damir, thank you. Uh, we have a little problem with the translator online. Dani or technicians, can, da, can they fix that in a second? Then, le pedimos disculpas a nuestra audiencia que tenemos un pequeño problema con, con la traducción que no se está escuchando al intérprete. A ver si podemos eh, arreglar el, el problema para que nuestra audiencia nos pueda entender lo que estamos diciendo. Sí, estoy, estoy arreglando. Um, un segundo, just a second, Mr. Damir, and we continue. Thank you. Okay. We are waiting for a little problem. So meanwhile, maybe I can go towards, I don't know, maybe you can interrupt us if you have lost some piece of the important things that Damir was saying. And Cristina, thank you very much. I believe that you already have said a lot of important things. It is not easy. There will be problems, but the focus, the approach, the awareness of the time and orientation and the final goal are important things. And in Tanis has also been a parallel process. Not everything has been done in the constituent assembly but in this case it was not a new group of people chosen but it was the parliament that already existed so now maybe we can move forward in this meanwhile the translation it's coming back so it is the expectations and ambitions issue because you actually mentioned something related to that new constitution pretend to provide the framework to solve and not to get down to violent issues of the past but uh, the assemblies and the countries that it are the owners of that, the, uh, you have the mi microcosmos of diversity in each process uh, and also carries all these previous conflicts. Uh, so how individuals and com collective groups handle the expectations, not to expect uh, too much. And Christina, you said uh, something about the uh, academic will to go deeper. Um, 
at the same time to get to that port uh, where we can just get down to business and be practical. So can you share with us your experience about that? Because in many countries where we have been working, where we see peace processes and national dialogues, those are important topics. How do I po locate my expectations and how we all together can make it work for having an assembly like that? So Alfredo, let me check. Uh, how is the translation doing? Can we, did we listen everything that Damir said? They, are, they have just mentioned, Mr. Damir and Mr. Cristina, that uh, when they are re restarting a system, and these are the things that happen uh, in times of the Zoom and YouTube and all that. Our apologies to the audience. We are restarting a little system. So our system talk to the, trans, uh, the broadcasting system. So the questions that our colleague Barbara has asked uh, Christina and Amir locate us a very position us very well in the matter of feelings at the beginning of the situation or the constituent process and now let's go to the next step how was it how was the practical part and here we continue with the conversation because translation it's already working again Damir Christina okay if translation has caught up with Damir I would again maybe ask Christina to to give us some insights and please all remember we will have more time for questions observations this is just whetting our appetite for for learning from Christina and Damir where to look at where to go deeper oh um yes of course people go into a constitutional assembly often well sometimes bewildered but often with expectations that there'll be fundamental change and fundamental change along lines that they've already become committed to. And then you have opposing views and a whole complicated mix trying to um, come to some agreement amongst all these different ideas. Um, uh, for us, they were very, very strong in many ways, and I, we can talk about that in more detail a bit later. Um, I've already said this, and I'm going to keep saying it. <laughs> we were very, and in fact, Amir also said it in, in, in perhaps different words, we were very mindful of the danger of the process breaking down. We'd already learnt um, in earlier negotiations while we were getting prisoners released and so on, political prisoners released, how dangerous dangerous it is to come to an agreement and then just break it um, or refuse to listen to what other people are trying to say, to ride roughshod over other people's views. Um, so many people in the assembly kept that in mind and tried to keep it as a, a sort of listening process, dialogue process, which could come to some kind of agreement. As Damir says, the constitution has in the end to belong to everybody. Everybody is unlikely to love every single provision in it, but it must be all of us. Um, and of course, I, I'm going to just refer to one other country where I was involved in um, the drafting of their constitution, Kenya. They learned this lesson of the importance of agreement the, a very hard way because they had a constitution making process that started in 2000, a very elaborate process with a wonderful public participation program and a very energetic public involved and so on. But finally, they didn't really reach adequate agreement and the process collapsed. Um, one of the, the results of that collapse was a few years later at election time, they had very serious violence. Um, they are still displaced, that was 2010, people are still displaced in Kenya as a result of that, and many people died. It shocked Kenyans. So next time round, um, you could feel that people were working much harder to 
decide which the issues were that really mattered and which issues they could compromise on, which issues they could leave to be resolved by ordinary politics in the future. And what they wanted was a good framework for an active political, an active and inclusive citizenry running politics in the future. Um, it's obviously a bit more complicated than that, but it, it was a hard lesson that um, I'm always mindful of, the cost of that collapse of the process in Kenya in 2005. But on one more practical note, let me give just one example of a way in which I think we helped um, people talk to each other, managing manage these very often very far apart expectations or expectations of what the constitution should look like. And that was, we heard a great deal from people from other countries. Now, South Africans, I think, were famously jealous of their process. The constitution was ours, only we wrote it, and it was no one else's. If you hear in other parts of the world someone saying that they wrote a bit of the South African constitution, it is not true. We did it. Um, and the members of our Consti Constitutional Assembly held the pen um, with great public input. Um, but what did, you know, why do I say that listening to other people helped? One of the things that happened is, you know, Germans and Canadians and Indians, people from all over the world came and told us about their constitutional arrangements. That was a fantastic learning curve for me and for everybody else. Some people in our Constitutional Assembly already were extremely well versed in comparative constitutional systems, but many people weren't. And what these meetings with people from other systems did was brought all those people together and kind of got them onto the same page. But the other thing that did besides preparing people to have some sophisticated conversations, is when the South Africans listened to people describing a foreign system, they immediately started think, saying, well, would it work for us? Wouldn't it work for us? Why would it work for us? Why would it not work for us? Those conversations became quite rich. And in the course of that, the members, the South African people in these meetings, from a wide range of different interest groups and backgrounds, started to develop a shared understanding of how things might work in South Africa and might not. So in some ways, what foreigners presented to us became a good sounding board for us to struggle through and reach some understanding of what might work for us and why we thought things would work and would not work. It helped us have an internal conversation. Just one example, that is. Thank you, Christina. Excellent examples and excellent areas to take into account. And Amir, of course, uh, you are going to share more with us. I invite you to share. And I hope that this time we don't have problems with the translation. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think it's, uh, it's important for the process that people who are carrying out the process, uh, they will have input from, from many, many uh, places. Uh, but uh, there are fundamentals on which they would have to agree early on, so they can they can get into the details. And uh, and we know that this is a process that started and eventually it will end. Uh, and the question is, what are we going to do between now that we just started and then when it ends? Uh, I strongly agree uh, with Chris, with uh, with Christina on the issue of being afraid of failure. Uh, without exaggerating uh, uh, that point in the minds of the politicians and of the people, uh, uh, I do agree, they should be very mindful of the consequences of failure. And, uh, and uh, uh, in spite of all the goodwill, uh, failure uh, may be a result. But uh, there are so many 
uh, other factors that would lead a lot more to success than failure. We can, we can avoid failure. Uh, and uh, how to avoid failure in our uh, experience is that we did not exaggerate our differences. Uh, we spoke softly on differences. Uh, uh, we were gentle on these differences. And the, and the other thing is that uh, uh, as politicians or as elected people to do this, uh, be, be a member of the Constitutional Assembly, our opinion had to reflect many, many other people who were around us. In other words, uh, sometimes you belong to a political party uh, and, uh, and you feel the pressure, for instance, from your political party, and that prevails over uh, your, uh, uh, the fact that you represent people. You're there representing people. You're not representing your party. You represent people and you represent your country. And uh, the views of your, of your party uh, may be uh, important, and it's something uh, to have in mind. But your first loyalty has to be to the people for whom you are writing the constitution. And, uh, and this is from my personal experience is uh, sometimes I went against what, uh, what my political party uh, uh, thought uh, because I thought, uh, I thought my people were a lot more important than my party. And, uh, and, and I thought uh, uh, this is the national uh, interest. And now that I was elected, I don't represent my party. I represent my people. And my people were all the Tunisian people, not just the ones who, who, who voted for us. Uh, and the people also have to, uh, uh, have to understand that these members of the Constitutional Assembly uh, are called upon uh, to shape their views. And they should help them do that in an easier way. Uh, and especially when you have so many regions and you have people at different social levels and you have uh, academics that are in universities and you have people who, who do nothing but politics. And then you have the other common people. You have to understand that people writing this constitution have to listen to, to everyone. And inclusivity is key to this and people one, uh, because the people, uh, as member of the of the Constitutional Assembly, when I was in the Constitutional Assembly, I was representing the people, and then when I was outside the Parliament, I was representing the Constitutional Assembly, and I was doing everything I can to convince people of the choices that were made for the Constitution. So playing that double role makes it very difficult for members doing this mission of writing a constitution. So everyone has to put themselves in the shoes of the other and things will work well. Uh, uh, and uh, the more people put themselves in the shoes of others, the easier it's going to go. And when people go just to negotiate, it's very different than going to a dialogue. When you go to negotiate, you have preset goals that you want to get to. And I hope that does not happen because for us at the beginning, we started seeing more of that, that the people come with positions and they come to negotiate. And then many, many times we had a discussion on what is the dialogue. When you come to the dialogue, it's a dialogue. It's not a negotiation, it's a dialogue. And it's important to be ready to, to accommodate the views of, uh, of others. Uh, and I think by doing that, People have to remember, after all, uh, we were doing this not only for us, but mostly for the next generations, for our kids. And uh, uh, you, we had to forget our, about ourselves a little bit. And the fear was that different parties will try to solve political conflicts in this forum. Because when uh, people, when, when they are strong about the political views and uh, uh, they try to make every form a, a place to, to settle disagreements. Uh, this particular form is, is, one, it's about everyone. For us, it was about every Tunisian. And two, it was not just for this generation. I mean, mm -hmm. you don't write constitutions every day. Yeah. So people have to not only see differences in social 
uh, in the context in this, but they also understand that they are writing this for future generations mm -hmm. and they should be selfless and really think of others and things will go well. Yeah. We have a lot of questions, and one of those it is the how is the constituent uh, meeting again site? So, what it is happening inside of that constituent assembly, and how is it connected to other areas of the countries? For example, we in Berco we talked about uh, listening to ourselves and everyone to start playing with different ideas without getting down to an agreement, uh, humbling aspects, uh, um, not only with your position of your party, but also you are responsible for everyone that elected you. And you mentioned those important topics also. And it is also really interesting for me that this is not really easy to put it in, a, in some kind of agreement or rule. It's not a formal thing. It is um, actually an attitude and a, a commitment, a personal commitment of each person and also the, from everyone together. So we will go down to the last question here in the panel because Alfredo already has a lot of interesting questions, but uh, let me go with this last question to look at the Constituent Assembly from inside. We already said something about that, but what is going on with the Constituent uh, and the relation with the surroundings in South Africa, in Tunis, how did you prepare the country to have the let legal or legitimized uh, uh, results of this process because after this first process you have to go through a final referendum with a mandatory vote so that is also um, looking beyond the nine or 12 months that this is uh, it's going to take the first part of the period Christina we are going to start with you and then Damir and then we go to Alfredo with the other questions Christina thanks very much and I will go to that question but I do want to say just one thing in relation to constitution making and negotiation um, because in South Africa we talked about a negotiated process Slightly diff different political situation, but I think in many constitution making processes, there is at least some time or another where there's something more like a negotiation than a very open shared dialogue. But we can perhaps come back to that. Um, well, South Africa had a wonderful public participation campaign um, to try and draw people into the process. Um, we had a poster, for instance, saying the Constitution is, is made by the most important person in the country, you. And this poster was distributed around the country. Whether that was exactly true, I'm not sure, but certainly there was a lot of opportunity for people to engage. And we received um, tens of thousands of submissions from people. I think one important part of that process was that over weekends, members of our constitutional assembly went out formally as constitutional assembly members to talk to people, particularly in rural areas because they had less access to news and all of those things. And this was 30 years ago, no social media. Um, and I mean, there are picture, moving pictures of groups of politicians often, or groups of members of the assembly, I should say, often, who came from very different backgrounds. Some people who'd been in jail for many, many years, standing next to people who'd been in the government that had put them in jail. So it's political prisoners now released and the people who imprisoned them. Are they jointly talking to people about our new constitutional project? I think that was wonderful. Um, but at the same time, those politicians all learnt more about the country in their engagement with people. 
And I found that in other constitutional processes as well. One sort of quite moving example for me is when I was working on a constitution commission in Fiji, another member of the commission, a Fijian who'd been deputy prime minister some 40 years before, and who knew the country really well, said after talking to the public over some months, how much she'd learned about the country. And listening to people broadly um, and actually engaging with them, um, I think helps. The other thing, and this, I'll just say this in one sentence, is our process was very transparent. Most of it happened in, you know, with public access free. The public didn't often come because quite a lot of the discussion is very boring, but <laughs> it was always open. So that also gave a sense of inclusiveness, I think, to the process. Again, there's much more to say and much has been written about this, but it's a start. Given the many experiences that you can share with us, and many of the Chilean also can would be able to share uh, these uh, experiences uh, in this amazing dialogue and journey of conversations, and uh, including all the diversity. And Damir, briefly, how has it been that preparation of the country that you have done in Tunis? How is it? Uh, yeah, for, uh, for Tunisia, we did, uh, we did go with the idea that uh, it's better to encourage the public to say what they want at the early stages, rather than asking them later because they may say no. Uh, so, uh, including them in the process uh, was was important uh, to the point uh, the, uh, for practical issues. Uh, in Tunisia, one, we have set up a national program for regional dialogues on the constitution. And uh, Tunisia is divided into 24 districts. Uh, I was in six of the 24 districts to talk about the constitution. And we had people everywhere talking about the constitution. Then we set up a website where we put all the articles that the Constitutional Assembly uh, uh, came up with and agreed uh, to, we would put them all online. And uh, we, we, we let people actually go in and edit, kind of like uh, Wikipedia, uh, where people, they can make comments and they can even uh, propose a new way of, of saying something and so forth. Uh, people felt that they were writing the constitution. And that's how, even though we did not have to have the buy-in of people when we did the constitution, because it was us, the members of the National Assembly, uh, that were just to vote the constitution. It, uh, it was all in our hands. Uh, in spite of that, we wanted to guarantee that we have consensus and acceptability. So uh, we were, uh, we went everywhere. Uh, we put the constitution articles that were in the making. Everything was online and the public uh, would actually go in and propose things for the constitution. The input was so much that we had actually to take a whole month for the committee that was uh, uh, writing the article to actually take all of that public input and put it into the constitution. That's why in Tunisia, I say, no, it's, it was not uh, just the National Assembly that wrote the Constitution. The National Assembly approved it, but actually writing it, it was not just the National Assembly. It was uh, the public. Uh, I can even remember uh, receiving articles that were uh, written so well, uh, probably by people who were professors at universities and so forth, that were even uh, in a better uh, uh, format and made even more sense than what we wrote as members of parliament. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's important and it's even, we did it in Tunisia, not because we were having a referendum because it was in the hands of the assembly, but the buy-in afterwards uh, was, uh, uh, was great because then when we were about to vote, people already, we, we already had the buy-in of the people we represented. And that was, uh, uh, and that was important. Uh, the constitution passed with very, very high vote.
Thank you very much, Damir. Very impressive. And I think that also shows the potentiality of the social network. And uh, today it's even more, it's a new challenge that uh, the process is taking up in Chile. Thank you for the very honest and brief way to introduce us uh, a small introduction of what we can see later. And for this, we already have questions and Alfredo and his team has made a great uh, job in taking those questions in a condensated way to these uh, panels so we can discuss uh, the 40 minutes uh, that we have uh, pending. So Alfredo, please tell us. Thank you. Our team for the Nansen group and from the Chilean Society also, uh, they are sending us a lot of uh, questions through YouTube channel and social network uh, channels. Uh, and the questions are related to three things, expectations, trust, and the third one, it is anger and fe fear. So, Cristina, this question is for you from Patricia Pulitzer. You, how did you? How do we face the anger of some and the fear of others? How did you make it? How did you face the anger of some and the fear of others? Well, the anger, that's an excellent question. Um, and there's no easy answer. Certainly, South Africa tried, and I don't know that we have yet succeeded. But I suppose, first, the constitution making process isn't the only place, and possibly isn't even the best place, to try and deal with the very, very sort of deep um, anger that was a result in South Africa of the marginalization of the majority of the population and brutal treatment by security police. Um, but the constitution making process did help, I think, because it was really built as a nation building process. It, it emphasized again and again and again that we had to somehow make the country work together. We had the advantage, of course, of having an extraordinary leader in Nelson Mandela um, and a number of very prominent politicians and religious leaders who contributed to that and supported the constitution making. So the constitution itself, um, I think, captures some of the need to heal and come together again, reflect on the past, but it's only one little snippet of that conversation. And something we haven't mentioned yet, and I'm just gonna throw it in in case we forget it, is of course women were greatly involved in all of this um, and contributed to that kind of bridge building between among many different communities that was so necessary, um, as well of course as being very active in the Constitutional Assembly. Um. We have more questions. Mario González, Mario González and Alito Borges and Marcelo Guajardo asked us uh, in different ways, but the question is the same. How was it uh, the citizens' participation? How did you get the conversation in the um, in Tunis and in South Africa, how did you get the, that conversation between the constituent process and the citizens for both of you? What about Damir first? Go ahead. So we, 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 we're, we're in the South Africa. It's good to, go ahead, go ahead. Um, well, we had it, as I said, through a great deal of publicity, education programs, and so on. But one thing that 
I think probably distinguishes South Africa both from Tunisia and from um, um, Chile at the moment is that we had very, very strong political parties that people felt represented them. So we had only a tiny number of small, you could almost call them independents in our constitutional assembly. The public had a great deal of trust in a handful of big parties. And those parties, of course, um, kept up dialogue with their constituents. And that's an important thing and it makes South Africa different. Um, but otherwise it was people on radio, we had a talk show, show every week and people could ask questions. Um, politicians sometimes found themselves arguing or the, the members of the Constitutional Assembly found themselves arguing on these talk shows amongst themselves. And then of course questions would come in and you would feel a dialogue in what might otherwise be thought to be a bit of an artificial environment. And then let me add, you know, people went out, we produced drafts of what was being decided. We sometimes in those early drafts kept options. So if there wasn't agreement on a particular issue, you might find in a early draft, three or four different possibilities for a particular provision. So those differences were transparent and accessible. And people would talk about them, television programs, radios, I've said, in public meetings and within political parties, of course. It very, I mean, it's very varied and very nuanced, as in many other countries now. Yeah, uh, for the uh, for the case of Tunisia, the the composition of the uh, I'm sorry, I have to turn off for the phone here. Sorry, uh, for Tunisia, the composition of the national uh, of the constituent assembly was really a mosaic. And the way we did the electoral law is that we did end up with a very big mosaic uh, of, uh, of independence. There were, there were lots of independence, uh, especially that uh, before we went into elections, we did two things, uh, rightly or wrongly, but uh, uh, we dismantled the party that, uh, the, 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 that held the dictatorship for so long. So that uh, big uh, national party that was uh, for 23 years governing with, uh, uh, with a lot of dictatorship, uh, we dismantled that through a court decision. Uh, and two, uh, in our electoral law, uh, and this is maybe specific to us, uh, is that uh, we, we banned many of those, held, uh, those who held uh, official positions with the dismantled party to present themselves uh, for elections to the Constitutional Assembly. So they were, they were not allowed to participate in the process after dismantling uh, their part. And we did this just the one, uh, the one time for the uh, Constitutional Assembly. Uh, so we end up really with, with a mosaic. Women uh, were very present. Uh, we had the largest presence of women because in the electoral law, we also uh, imposed uh, parity in presenting electoral lists. Uh, at the end, uh, independence uh, played uh, a very, very important uh, role because uh, the mosaic that we ended up with, there was only one party that has a large group, 80-some uh, 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 members of parliament among the 217. Uh, so uh, they were a large group that held really one opinion. Uh, but for everything else, it was really a mosaic of independence and very, very small parties that you can almost call them uh, independent. And they were the ones who set the stages uh, in most of the uh, cases. And here, maybe I, I will just make one comment in conclusion to this question. Uh, in Tunisia, when we put together the mechanism for the resolving issues around the constitution, uh, we set up the mechanism that every political party had only one vote. Uh, why would the party that has 80 some uh, representatives had an equal vote as much as a party that has only two people in parliament? Because we thought that those 80 people that were all from one party represented one point of view. 
and therefore there is no weighted uh, voting uh, when it came to resolving issues on the constitution. It was really which the people that had different views, each view was represented by one, and we did not take care or take into consideration uh, the political parties. The political parties, clearly, they had their ideas, they had their representatives, but uh, we, we did not do anything in the mechanisms for resolving questions and differences. We did not make any difference or give any advantage to a party that had many people or, or, or little people. And it was, uh, and like I said, uh, outside of the, of the Constitution Assembly, uh, civil society. Uh, was the, the greatest pressure groups were the civil society. And inside, uh, and inside the parliament, independents and very small parties uh, had a lot of weight because the party was really a mosaic. And even the majority party at the time, which is the Islamist party, sometimes they complained about the way we were running things because their size was much bigger than everyone else. And we always said the same argument is that you're 80 people representing one view. And those two people are also representing one view and it's about views. This is for the people. So it was not according to political parties. So in, in our configurations, political parties, we said, well, you have people representing you, but as far as mechanisms that we are using, we're not going to focus on a party or the size of a party or how many seats they have uh, in this. So the mosaic helped a lot and the independents played a, a, an extremely important role in balancing uh, the seat. Thank you very much, Damir. Really, the questions that we are getting are to to continue talking for a few hours, but this is an important question that it is also repeated. Uh, and Alito Borges Ramirez asks, uh, he says, how do we regulate the expectations of society regarding the changes that we want to implement in the new constitutions? How do we regulate those expectations? How was it done in South Africa and in Tunis? Yeah, in, ter in terms of, of uh, managing uh, expectations, it's, uh, it's very important to talk about the scope of this. Uh, writing the constitution uh, is definitely not the place to resolve uh, uh, the political uh, differences. The political differences will result in, in different views and we, will and, and we only discuss the views. Uh, uh, ideology, uh, people come with their ideologies. Uh, and I even go further and say people do have their prejudice, but they don't have the right to act on it. You can have all kinds of prejudice, but that does not mean that you act on your prejudice. Uh, uh, keep it to yourself and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and limit the scope to really writing the constitution, remembering that you're writing the constitution for everyone and also for future generations. Uh, uh, in terms of expectations, managing expectations, uh, of course, different people expect different things from the constitution and they think it will solve everything. Uh, I think uh, uh, you have to manage the expectations by, I would not say uh, lowering the expectations because sometimes you may destroy a lot of hope by lowering expectations, but I would say set them where they should be and, uh, and don't overload the the, the, this process, this constitution writing process, don't overload it and don't promise people that it will solve all of their problems. They have to understand that this is, uh, this is a constitution and uh, a constitution is meant to put the, the, the ground foundation for better laws, a better system, a better inclusion, a better society. But we should not go into the details of, of, of how the constitution uh, will impact the daily life of everyone, we have to really keep it in the context of this constitution will give us the framework to build a different system and to build a different nation. And if we come to an agreement on the constitution, uh, we can do great things. 
uh, but but actually uh, writing the constitution should not have any promises that will it will immediately solve this problem or immediately solve uh, that problem and uh, and that's how we manage the expectations because some people the, thought that the, the new constitution will solve poverty, will solve this, will solve education, will... No, uh, the, new, the, the, the new constitution will, uh, will talk about your rights and your obligations as a citizen. It will talk about our system of government. It will talk about who will represent me uh, tomorrow, who will write my laws. Uh, it will talk about uh, if the law is no good, how do we make sure that it does not pass and things of that sort and 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 the common it's normal that you have to educate the common people through awareness program and if they know if they know what is this process exactly they will not over expect things from it so communication is very important thank you damir christina with all the pain and all the injustices of South Africa that South Africa had before the process of writing your constitution. How did you manage the expectations that the South African people had at that time? Well, I think that Demir has his very last sentence is you know, a critical one. It's about communication. But I also think that in South Africa, and again, this is the South African story particularly, um, it was the shift to democracy, the first democratic elections on which people pinned hopes for a better life. And then the constitution was one piece of that. So we included in the constitution social and economic rights um, that um, are enforceable in courts, which is quite unusual or was then in the common law world. Um, I know not in Latin America, but um, you know that was new. Um, did we manage expectations well enough right now, 25 years after the constitution was adopted? There is still anger, I think, about the failure of the constitution to adequately control, uh, develop and control, or provide the basis for developing and controlling a system of land redistribution. And land is critical for us. Um, I can't remember the exact figure, but under apartheid, something like 14% um, of the population possessed 87% of the land. It had really been stolen from people. Um, and that needed to change. The constitution kind of promised that, um, but <clears throat> too little has happened. That's not the fault of the constitution, in my view. It's the fault of all the complicated processes that were inadequately supported after the constitution was adopted. So much of it is about implementation. But also as you speak about managing expectations, the other thing that comes to my mind is back to this issue of fears. Um, you know, how could, I mean, some people, especially groups that had had an enormous amount of power under the old order and knew they would have much less power or they'd have to be more, um, inclusive and be prepared to engage more broadly in in the political arena in the future um, had fears and I think one of the ways those fears were bridged was finding common denominators what do we share in South Africa and they mean there are many basic human values that South Africans share we could talk about those later on a more sort of kind of constitutional note Something South Africans believe in is an independent judiciary. We've got a sort of reasonable history, not great, but not awful, of um, independent judges and the rule of law. For South Africans, the rule of law was important. There was a, a kind of cross-sectional understanding that the rule of law was critical and trust amongst those people who feared that they might be targeted by a new constitution, deprived under a new constitution. They believed that a strong commitment to the rule of law would be honored and would um, ensure that a constitution that protected the separation of powers and so on would actually provide a stable basis. Now, there were some others, but the rule of law comes to mind first as perhaps the most important thing. 
Thank you, Christina and the mayor. We have a question that comes from two people in the audience, Nicola Santa Maria and Claudia Lillo Echeverri. In different ways, they are asking how can we make sure they about the incidents from the citizens' perspective in the work of the constituent member work, and how how can you get to participate and to be listened as original people or indigenous people? Damir, Cristina, who would like to help us with your experience in Tunis or in South Africa? It's always a, these are the difficult things. What we did in South Africa um, was made very serious attempts to do have education programs through the Constitutional Assembly um, and public participation in um, indigenous communities. And of course, you know, South Africa then, even more so than now, was really made up of indigenous communities. So the situation is a little bit different to one in which um, indigenous communities are a minority. Um, but nonetheless, I think the something that has worked in many countries is just very concerted public education um, and opportunities for people to participate. Often that is done by um, NGOs under the auspices of a constitutional assembly or on their own. Um, in Kenya, for instance, we produced educational documents. The committee that was running the process when I was there produced educational documents and designed for different sectors of society. Um, but I have no doubt that uh, Chileans are creative and will come up with the kind of ideas that will make the process exciting. Um, and then people come on board very fast um, and contribute. Well, in, uh, in Tunisia, the, the process uh, the, one, the country geographically is not very spread, and two, the populations were very, uh, the, the Tunisian population is very homogeneous. Uh, you know, Tunisia uh, is, has always been a Mediterranean uh, mix of African culture, Mediterranean culture, Arab culture, uh, Muslim culture, uh, Ottoman Empire uh, culture. And, and we have a lot of people from, from Spain. Uh, when you look at the last names in Tunisia, uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a big uh, mix. But over the years, uh, Tunisian uh, populations uh, have become very homogeneous, even, even in, 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 in their culture. Uh, nevertheless, uh, reaching to communities is very important regardless of whether it's in, in indigenous people or, uh, or, or just uh, a regular citizen, uh, because uh, in a way, everyone is special, uh, whether they are uh, uh, the originals of that uh, uh, land who, who, uh, or people uh, in Tunisia, uh, would, no one can really talk about uh, they have any particular right to the land that the other doesn't. It's just... Uh, uh, everyone is Tunisian, and uh, and even in terms of uh, of religion, uh, the second most important per Tunisia, a country that's ninety nine percent Muslim, but we have the second most important pilgrimage uh, center for the Jews. Uh, we have the Christians. When you go to the main avenues, you always find a, a, a church. But uh, uh, the Tunisians did not feel that those were really. Uh, differences that should be carried into discussion at all. We felt very homogeneous in this. However, representation is very important. I think uh, uh, people have elected these people in the in the constitutional assembly, and they have put their faith in them. 
these people have to understand that very, very well and take that responsibility very, very seriously is that they represent the people who voted for them. And, uh, and, and which means that uh, I think, uh, and what, what I personally did for, for, for my constituency, one, I developed my ideas around the main issues, six or seven major points uh, of the constitution, the political system, uh, uh, the relationship between the people and the power, the executive. Uh, and, then, and then after that, I started going and socializing that idea in circles that could amplify my time. So if I spent a week in the region talking to multiple people, I made sure that the people that were in the crowd were the ones that would actually, uh, if, if I talk for an hour, they would be able to talk for 24 hours after me. Uh, so I did look for people who would amplify my time. Uh, because then otherwise you would not have time to accomplish your work as, as a member of the Constituent uh, Assembly. And that, uh, and that worked very well. Uh, the, the, these people have to develop a circle around them. And uh, in my case, there were people that, uh, people when they had questions, they would come to them be, even before they discussed with me. Because those, uh, I had six or seven uh, in my constituency uh, the, that basically represented me. And then if there is anything, then they would relate to me. You have to, you have to develop that, uh, that circle around you of trusted people, but they, they also have to be uh, people uh, of, a, of a certain uh, intellectual level so they can amplify the time. But definitely, definitely involve everyone in the early stages of the process. Because afterwards, you, uh, one, you will not have the time. And, uh, and two, when you bring people after thought, uh, it's better to ask them now what they want than later on present them with something and there is the possibility that they can say no. And this is fundamental and even more important in Chile than Tunisia because the constitution will go through a referendum. So this particular point is extremely important. And I think the public, civil society, and community leaders, you have to have their buy-in so they can amplify your time and be convincing. And to be convincing, they have to be convinced themselves. Once, once they are convinced, then they can become convincing. So you have to work a lot on, 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 on convincing a circle around you. And once these are convinced, uh, if you convince 50 people, then as if you multiplied yourself by 50. It's uh, you clone yourself, try to clone yourself and your ideas, because there is no way as a member of the constituent assembly that you will be always at the right place at the right time, because uh, you will have to be at many places at the same time. If you manage this, mm. that will give you the best dialogue and that will buy you uh, a lot of consensus on, on, on what you do. Don't delay that. That's at an early, that's an early stage decision. Muchas gracias, Daniel y Cristina. We have a lot of questions, and I think that we are going to try to cover as many as we can before stopping with this conversation today. Claudia Zamora asks a question. Uh, it is related to the norms of the constituent process. Uh, she asks uh, Damir and Cristina, how did you make uh, happen the, or how did you make the norms of uh, constituent the participation inside, how did you come down to agreement about the basic norms on to make sure about to secure the conversation during the dialogue process for everyone to be able to participate? Christina Damir, who would like to start uh, um, telling us uh, about your experience in South Africa and in Tunis? I can I, I I can start then Christina will start the the, the first the next time. Uh, first for the constitution, uh, uh, first of all, nine months is uh, is a very short time. Uh, and I understand for the the for Chile it's set for nine months. Uh, maybe the maturity uh, for Chile is 
the political maturity is better and they already have a lot of ideas. But for us, when we started, we did not have ideas. And, uh, uh, and therefore, uh, a year uh, after the constitutional assembly was put in place, uh, then uh, uh, we also took care uh, so much of the regular laws because we were actually uh, also the regular parliament. Then after a year, we did not have a constitution. And, uh, and that, uh, that nearly uh, brought the entire system uh, to a collapse. Uh, we were very, very close to a total collapse of the process because we could not deliver in one year. And it was nearly impossible with everything else. However, uh, however, I say that uh, if we did not have everything else, maybe we could have managed to, to finish uh, within, within a year. Uh, the process has to be efficient. Uh, we did not have everyone involved in every part of the, of, of the Constitution. We, we said that the Constitution had uh, uh, nine sections, nine important sections, the political process, freedoms, uh, basic rights, things of that sort. So we divided ourselves into nine groups. And those nine groups, each one took care of one area in the Constitution. The voting was global. Everyone was voting on the entire Constitution. But we had different groups working on different sections. And every member of the constituent was allowed to be in two groups max. Therefore, everyone, if, if I was good at, at, at human rights and, uh, and things and, uh, or nature or whatever, a Green Party, then I would go to the sections of the, of the Constitution that had to do with that. If I am good at political systems, uh, constitutional uh, uh, law professors and so forth, they went into the political system section. So we had to optimize. And when we set the nine groups, and each group was to, to work on a section of the, of the parliament, uh, then uh, the, 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 the members of parliament can choose. And I think that was a very, very uh, efficient process uh, in order to be able to, uh, uh, to finish in, uh, in nine months. But like I said, uh, writing the constitution and being efficient about the process is one thing and making sure that you have the buy-in of everyone so you, you don't end up alone. If I represent 60,000 people, when at the beginning, they are the ones who voted for me. 60,000 people voting for me and I represent them now. At the end, I have to have all of them on board with me on this new constitution. And I saw that that was my responsibility when I was in my constituents, convincing them that what the constituent assembly has done is the right thing. And even if they disagreed, and if sometimes I myself disagree, but there is a higher goal than all this. So when I was in my constituents, among my constituents, I was an ambassador for the Constitutional Assembly. And when I was in the Constitutional Assembly, I was the ambassador for my people. And it's a delicate balance. But as long as you keep the higher goal, the national goal, and the multi-generation goal in mind, uh, it will become an easy process. Cristina, thank you, Damir. Muchas gracias, Damir. Cristina. Yeah, very briefly then on, on that, because ours was a little bit different, I think. Um, like Chile, we had a requirement of a two thirds majority to get the constitution through eventually. Um, and we started basically by taking the basic rules of parliament and then, you know, adapted them a little bit for the special circumstances of the constitutional assembly. Um, but, you know, in my view, although I was there, day and night for the process. Um, the rules were never, besides those two thirds final vote, the rules really never needed to be relied on. So perhaps the most important part of the structures that were added to what were basic parliamentary rules and are similar in common law Westminster style parliaments around the world, um, so perhaps the most important thing was we established an executive committee, which um, would agree on the agendas and things like that. Also got reports from the secretariat that was doing the public participation and various other things and arranging special events, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I said earlier, all these meetings were open. 
So the executive committee didn't exclude other people going to listen. And sometimes when there were other people listening, they could be engaged in those meetings too. Um, but it was probably the most important element of our sort of special adjustment of the rules. Um, we started um, with theme committees, just as, as Tunisia and many other processes, we actually had six. But after we'd got into the process and those theme committees had kind of sort of started pulling work together with the support of technical advisors, um, they got disbanded and we moved into different committees agreed to by the management committee um, and that meant sort of really agreed to by the whole body so there wasn't any contest about that and the new committees would have been unpredictable at the beginning of the process but they were committees that focused on issues that had not been adequately resolved or were committees that sort of brought together three interlinked things and so on and did them there. So it was sort of a development. As the constitution got further developed, we changed the sort of committee structure. Almost everything happened in committees. Um, I can't remember a vote taking place, um, sort of on an every, you know, in, in these everyday committees. Um, we sort of struggled through to reach agreement. Sometimes when there was disagreement, the chair of a committee would say, we're gonna have tea. We had a lot of tea breaks, a lot of lunch breaks, a lot of evening snack breaks. Um, and those breaks would be to cool people off a bit and also to have them perhaps to have the main people who were having the main disagreements talk to each other a bit sort of outside. And that often, so that was informal. That wasn't in the rules. Um, nor was it in the rules that some nights we'd be there at one o'clock in the morning and the chairperson of the assembly would say, I'm sorry, I can't let you go until this matter is decided. Otherwise we won't finish in time. And that was sort of quite exceptional leadership, I think, from the chairperson who happens to be South Africa's president at the moment. Um, so we didn't make a big thing of the rules to begin with. They can be changed. We knew we could change them at any point in the process. So we weren't really committed. Um, it wasn't a hard commitment. We just wanted something that would work. Um, I know Bolivia had a different story, but I think that was for different reasons. There was sort of uh, an interest in perhaps obstructing the process. Um, but I suppose my message would be that flexibility is possibly the most important thing because you can get business done. Thank you very much, Damir, Christina. Now, Barbara, please. Um, let me just add myself up to this thank you expressions because we can be here talking for hours and hours because we have a lot of experiences, angles, aspects. Uh, so this is it is not a conclusive event how to do it, how not to do it. It's just to start uh, interchanging different experiences. And what I take with me personally is that the Constituent Assembly, it is a, a very important process, a historical with great potential and with great risks also. And uh, everyone, it is really aware of what they are doing and uh, it, it gets some benefits for example, from the flexibility of other mechanisms uh, so we can listen to each other, not to jump into conclusions and to be transparent about our differences. But also, as Damir said, this is the goal. This is the final, the ultimate goal to get it done for the future generations. The uh, conscious or the awareness of each of the members, it is not to, to transform the whole country with this constitution. It's just a framework. And Christine also said it, that uh, many topics like poverty will need uh, many more processes. And thank you for the questions. The topic of expectations and participation is key to allow spaces in which, as a citizen, I can share what I think, of course, handling my expectations. Uh, it is not just because I wrote something to a constituent member, I'm going to have that written in the Constitution. So it's part of it. 
Thank you very much, Cristina, Damir, Alfredo, and your team to channel uh, you, the questions. And thank you for the questions. There are a lot of representative questions. Uh, I hope that this is not the last opportunity to talk about experiences like this. Uh, so, Alfredo, thank you very much. Barbara, thank you. Before, when we were getting ready for this session, Damir, who is uh, also in charge of cybersecurity in Tunis, um, Tunisia, so he said that for this Zoom session, that it is uh, has to be working like this one, more than 50 programs uh, were supposed to be working. And today we have 48 working properly, but we are going to recover that later on, of course. We are really flexible with all of this. In, on my side, Cristina, with all your experience and the pain, the feelings, the emotions that you brought back from South Africa and uh, me with all the memories and the feeling from Tunis uh, and the experience of you too, I can say that you are telling us a story and for this to work out uh, you had to believe in the process and grow up in the process and you are you have to be really or every part has to be really generous uh, and i will stick with that to believe and to grow in the constituent process that you had thank you very much again for the uh, especially the Barhoff Foundation, the social, the civil society in Chile. Mm, the, we w remember use the hashtag Por el Dialogo, all the co colleagues that make this possibly. And Cristina, thank you. We hope to be able to invite you again to another conversation. This is the very beginning of a conversation with experts like you, with people that has a lot of experience experience and Chile wish you the best and thank you very much on their behalf and we are going to get together again to have this conversation. Thank you for following us in this channel Barbara and the interpreter Sebastiana Aurora. Thank you for everything. Bye.